Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to Good Orderly Direction, Practical Tools of the Bible. I'm your host, Dr. Donnelly Snipes. Today we're talking about Exodus chapter 9, boils and hail, and the concepts of raising the bottom and losing to gain. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to the Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go and still hold them, the hand of the Lord will strike with a deadly pestilence to your livestock in the fields, the horses, donkeys, camels, the herds, and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing shall die of all of the belongings to the Israelites. We see here that God was systematically removing all of the things that the Egyptians treasured or coveted on earth. You know, with the blood, he removed their, their water. With the bugs, he removed their health. With the um, frogs dying and the challenges there, he was removing their or challenging the beliefs that they had been programmed to believe. With the flies, he was removing their stuff because it was all being destroyed. The Israelites had some things, but they loved God above all else, and they were willing to give them up. They were willing to walk away from it in order to have a better life. The Bible repeatedly talks about sometimes you have to lose to gain. In Hebrews 11, 24 and 26, by faith, faith, by faith, Moses refused to be called the son of the Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the teaching of Christ of more value than the treasures of Egypt. So Moses was looking to the greater reward. He was playing the tape through, as we talked about in the last video. He was recognizing the value of good orderly direction to help him achieve what he defined as a rich and meaningful life. Mark 8.35, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. It's important to recognize here the Israelites were getting ready to give up everything they had known, even though some parts of it really sucked. They were getting ready to give, give up everything they had known to go off onto this journey into the wilderness. That had to be terrifying. But they recognized that in order to have the life that they wanted, it was going to be important for them to go into, we'll call it uncharted territory. In recovery, we see the same thing. People often have to give up things that they are doing, that they are thinking, that they are holding on to in order to move to the life that they want, whether it's giving up drugs or giving up um, possessions, for example, if they have uh, acquired a bunch of possessions possessions and gotten into financial hardship. You know, sometimes we have to give up some things in order to move forward. Sometimes we have to give up some things like guilt and grief that we're holding on to in order to move forward. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of soot from the kiln and let Moses throw it into the air in the sight of the Pharaoh. It shall become fine dust all over the land of Egypt and shall cause festering boils on humans and animals throughout the whole land of Egypt. Now, this is kind of interesting. We've seen repeatedly throughout the Bible and we'll continue to see how the ancients seem to have more knowledge of meteorolo meteorological events and science than maybe we gave them credit for. They may not have understood how everything happened, but they did understand the sign. They saw the signs and recognized sometimes what was going to happen. So I think it's kind of interesting if we also look at the science of this. During this time, conditions such as boils or rashes would often cause people to be ostracized from one another. This further separates the people and prevents them from 
communicating, much like in the Tower of Babel. So we see here a people that it are go going to be plagued with these rashes and they're going to be sent to quarantine so they cannot communicate with one another. They cannot get together and start questioning the beliefs of the Pharaoh or what's going on. They are relegated to their own huts or houses or wherever, and they can't interact with other people. During this time, it's also important to recognize that the Egyptian farmers were dependent on the annual monsoon. When you were right around the Nile, and if you look at the um, maps, when you're right around the Nile, it's very, very fertile land. But you get a few miles out from the Nile, and it's desert. So it was imperative during this time, especially, you know, way back here before they had started learning about developing dams and irrigation and all that stuff. They relied on the monsoons every year to make the Nile flood in order to water their crops. Well, massive volcanic eruptions are associated with droughts. And the clouds of sulfurous gases from the eruptions cooled the earth by reflecting sunlight back up towards space and a caused a drop in the monsoon rainfall. So what we see is the ashes that are being thrown into the air from the kiln may be a representation of what's getting ready to happen. Bear with me. You know, think about what if Moses recognized that somewhere far off a volcano had erupted. And when volcanoes erupt, the clouds of volcanic ash spread for hundreds of miles. And then when it rains through that volcanic ash, it creates acid rain, which is going to burn. It's going to burn the skin. It can cause, um, you know, crops to die, but it can also cause problems on uh, for the people. So I think it's interesting to note that ash being thrown up into the air, causing rashes and boils, might be explained by acid rain from a volcanic eruption. Then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself before the Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go so they may worship me. From this time, I will send all of my plagues upon you yourself and upon your officials and upon your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For by now, I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. But I've let you live to show you my power and to make my name resound through all the earth. You're still exalting yourself against my people and I will not and, and will not let them go. Tomorrow I will cause the heaviest hail to fall that has ever fallen in Egypt. Then the Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said to them, This time I, I have sinned, and the Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Enough of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go. So Moses stretched out his hands to the Lord, then the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain no longer poured down on earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned once more and hardened his heart. Now, of course, we're talking about many, 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 many decades BC. But it's interesting to recognize that even in present day, in December 2018, the Anak Krakatau volcano sunk into the sea, causing a tsunami, but also continued to erupt below water. This caused an intense six-day volcanic storm that was supercharged by vaporized seawater that chilled to ice and the rising plume. Volcanic clouds contained a mass of frozen water equivalent to 600,000 Asian elephants, and volcanoes spew rock um, and ice fragments. So it's kind of interesting to see the progression of this because you have this volcano or potentially have this volcano that erupts and maybe Moses is given the knowledge that hey this volcano erupted so 
you know, bad mojo's fixing to happen. And he throws the ash up because he knows there's something that has to do with the ash that tends to cause crops to die and, and burns people. Then the, the ash goes up. So the ash from the volcano may start raining down on the people, which may cause the sores. But we also know that after the volcano erupts, because of the climate change and everything else, and potentially in this case, part of this volcano that erupted, we don't know which one it was, sunk into the ocean like the Anak Krakatau volcano and produced the hail and the, and the six-day thunderstorm that proceeded after the ash. So the science actually makes sense that there was a meteorological event that maybe Moses knew something about. If you want to look at it from a scientific standpoint, if you want to look at it as God choosing these things for very specific reasons, which many people do, that's true too. But even if you want to go with the scientific route, you've got to believe in a higher path. Well, you don't have to, but... I think one must believe that there's a higher power out there giving him this knowledge. You know, how in the world did he know that this was going to happen? We have no certain timeline for when all of the plagues took place. Moses may have still been raising the bottom to get the Israelites motivated to leave. Every time they think they're getting ready to go, the, the Pharaoh says, yeah, mm, no, maybe not. So then the people come back. Now think about when that's happened to you. you how many times you have a false start and then you've got to start over again and how frustrating that is. And the more times it happens, the more frustrated you get. This was also a way to encourage the people to see God's power, to have confidence in the fact that God could do anything. They're seeing how powerful he is with the, with the Nile and the, and the uh, frogs and the lice and the, everything else. They're recognizing. And, you know, back then they didn't have a whole lot of science. So even if... Moses was this, you know, Stephen Hawking of the BC period. They started to recognize that Moses knew things and Moses potentially could help lead them out of oppression. So they started to believe that together we can do anything. They have anger at the Pharaoh's broken promises and manipulation Every time they start to, to leave, Pharaoh pulls them back and says, oh, you only thought I was going to let you win. <laughs> they just want to live in peace. They don't want to overthrow the Pharaoh. They mean him no harm. They just want to have the dignity that they deserve. How do you see good orderly direction at work in your life? How do you see people coming together together? to unite, to oppose oppressors or oppressive ideologies. If you feel oppressed, how can you use your anger to move toward your rich and meaningful life? Stewing on anger just rots you out from the inside. And there's several proverbs about that. Using anger in a violent way only tends to make your situation worse because it causes the others to rise up against you. Using the energy that your body gives you when you're angry, when, when you feel like there's a threat, using that energy to say, okay, what do I need to do to get out of this? What do I need to do to move forward, to move away from this oppression? Not to move into it, not to become part of it or make it worse, but how can I use this energy to move toward what's important to me? Just something to ponder.